Well, thank you very much for this very nice introduction. Thank you, CMC, for inviting me to Melbourne. It's not, it's not the first time I'm here. The first time I came in uh, 1974, when obviously Melbourne was a bit smaller than it is now, and uh, the society was also a little bit different. But it was quite a, a funny event, and I thought maybe it's a bad start to a relationship, but it wasn't. It was a very good start to a relationship with Melbourne, which I've visited since then on really numerous occasions, and I always considered to be Melbourne to be like on a holiday. Because uh, initially in the 70s and also early 80s, there weren't any American newspapers. And so you didn't get any information about uh, international capital markets. This only came after the mid-1980s. And when I landed, I was thinking in the plane that a very good friend of mine with whom I had ski raced and also water skied all the, all, all the time in summer in Switzerland, he had uh, at the time an Australian girlfriend, but she had gone back to Australia for a while. So I thought it's a pity that I don't have her telephone number and uh, that I couldn't contact her. But that afternoon I went to see Potters and there was a gentleman, uh, Laurie Cox, and he said to me, Mark, are you doing anything for dinner? I said, no. So he said, okay, I have a dinner at my house and would you like to join? So I said, fine. So I went to the dinner and there was the girlfriend of my friend in Switzerland. And then after dinner she said, look, Mark, I can drive you home. So I said, wonderful. I mean, not what you think. <laughs> <laughs> I wish it is what you think, but it wasn't. <laughs> she drove me home, and suddenly, I mean, we had been drinking quite heavily, but suddenly, after like five minutes, the car drifted to the left, straight into a tree. And she broke her both arms, and I hit my head on the windscreen, and the br windscreen broke. And the next day, the police called me and said, uh, do you have any damage on your head? I said, no, not at all. I feel fine. I have a colossal hangover, but it's not from the windscreen. <laughs> <laughs> and so that was my start to Melbourne. And, and afterwards, we had always a very good time here. As you know, Australians don't drink enough. But that wasn't a problem for me. Anyway, I also want to thank you all for coming here after work and for giving me the opportunity to share some of my views with you about the global economy and uh, some major trends that are underway in society. First of all, let's see whether that works, because technology never works. It seems it doesn't work. <laughs> ah, here, okay. Well, it's a bit difficult for me to read it, but basically uh, what it is about is that in the Western world, governments have become larger and larger. And there are some economists who rightly point out that essentially economies that have a small government I'm not saying no government. No government is a tribal society, basically. And uh, uh, no government, can you please switch off your phone? No government essentially means that society doesn't progress much. It may be a lot of fun, but it, there is not much progress. On the other hand, if you have 100% government, it's like the Soviet Union, at the time where China and the communist rule on the Mao Zedong, you have also no freedom and there's no initiative for people to do things. And so there is uh, essentially uh, no progress either in society and you have uh, misery because the planning economy allocates resources 
uh, much more poorly than a market economy. So somewhere between zero government and 100% uh, government, there is the ideal size of government. And I'd say that the ideal size of government in most countries would be around 20%. Once you reach 50% of the economy, as it is the case in most European countries, and it's 40% now in the US, you have essentially a body of people, the bureaucracy, that retards economic development with regulation and a jungle of laws that only very sophisticated, uh, large multinationals understand and they can navigate between the laws, whereas the small businessman can't. And this is one factor that has led in the last 10 years to essentially very poor productivity growth in the Western world. And also it's led to a decline in the formation of new businesses. <laughs> so it, essentially what we have in the system is an expanding bureaucracy to essentially supervise the already existing, expanding bureaucracy. And uh, what we also have is essentially in the Western world, in my opinion, just take as an example myself. When I started to work in 1970 on Wall Street, I'm by the way Swiss, and I went to school in Switzerland and in London, then I started to work on Wall Street in 1970, and then in 73 I moved to Hong Kong and since then I lived in Asia uh, first 30 years in Hong Kong and now uh, the last 15 years essentially in Thailand in the north in Chiang Mai and so uh, when I started to work you could get in the US on a government bond 6% interest and the Dow Jones was selling with a dividend yield of around 7%. And throughout the 70s, interest rates rose. They went from 6% on 10 years bonds, 10 years notes, to over 15% in September 1981. So you had a rising interest rate structure. So you didn't have to be very smart. You just put your money that you saved in bonds or in cash, where cash returns also went up strongly, or you bought shares that were at very low valuations. And that is simply not given today. Young people today, they pay very high prices for equities, sky high prices for properties, which reduces the affordability of many young people. They simply don't have the money to buy apartments, condos, homes, and so forth. And uh, the opportunity of having high returns in future is no longer given. Number two, when I started to work, it was very easy to find a job. There were no Indians competing with you. There were no Chinese competing with you. So it was quite easy to find a job in a company. Nowadays, the competition is much worse. And actually, we have statistics that clearly show that in real terms, in real terms, is inflation adjusted. Today's uh, wages and salaries for the average household or the average person is lower than it was in 1970. So basically, Today, in my view, we have a generation of young people, they will earn in real terms inflation adjusted less than their parents, and they will also die poorer than their parents, partly because of rising taxation. So this is the Western world essentially, including when I talk about the Western world, I include Japan to that. Australia is a little bit uh, difficult to classify, because it's very special. <laughs> but anyway, uh, in the emerging world, and obviously Australia is not an emerging economy, but it has some features of an e emerging economy. It is very dependent on the resources. But basically, in emerging economies, where 80% of the world lives, 
You have young people, especially in former communist China and uh, in India that has liberalized the economy and given up on the policies of isolation and self-reliance and in the former Soviet Union. You have young people that will earn much more than their parents. They will live a much better life than their parents. They can travel, their parents couldn't. They can buy goods, they have a choice what they want to do in their lives in terms of occupation. So they have a better life. So that is the good part of the world at the present time. You have 80% of the world's population that is essentially progressing. And you have the Western world that, in, that frequently still lives in the belief of the 19th century colonialism when actually the Western world truly dominated the rest of the world, especially Britain at the time. So all these things uh, are very interesting and what they mean is that there is in the world an ongoing shift in the balance of economic power from the West, from Western Europe, the US and also Japan, to new countries, new countries like India, new countries like China, new countries in the Middle East, in Africa and in Latin America and so forth, and that these countries become economically combined very important, and that this shift in the balance of economic power also means that there is a huge shift in the, in the geopolitical pa balance of power. In other words, these new countries, they want to have a say in how the international world order is being run. And so you have tensions, in other words, economic tensions between the old established world and the new world. And equally, you have tensions between the power base that was, well, in the last hundred years, basically, with the US. And now it's increasingly being challenged by countries like China and Russia and also others. And that uh, creates, on the one hand, of course, uh, opportunities, but it also creates problems uh, that are difficult to surmount. And uh, what is remarkable is that the shift in the balance of economic and political power occurred in a surprisingly short period of time, when you just consider if you came here to Melbourne in the mid-1990s, nobody dreamt that there would be this invasion of Chinese buying up properties. Yes, there were some Hong Kong Chinese and some Singapore Chinese and some Indonesian Chinese that bought properties here. But nobody envisioned that zillions of Chinese from the mainland would become buyers of properties here and participate in the economy. The same throughout Asia, no? This happened suddenly, and uh, nobody thought that it would happen this quickly. And we have to analyze why. In my view, this relative decline of the Western world compared to the emerging mar markets is partly due to the interventions in the West by governments with fiscal measures, in other words, tax policies, and with government spending, and in particular with monetary policies that have had very negative uh, consequences, and consequences that were not intended. So we have to look at what could we do and what is likely to happen in future with these policies, because the central bankers, they have become, say if you go back to the 70s, central bankers were not particularly important. But nowadays, for some reason, these central bankers have become huge stars. They are basically the ones that finance the government and they have a huge power when they are not even elected. And the worst part is that they have no personal responsibility if they mess it up. They mess it up, they retire, they go and give speeches to Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley that paid half a million dollars a speech. 
That's the, you, you, the difference between a mis businessman who runs his business in the ground, he loses his money. The central bankers lose your money, not their money. You understand? That is a huge difference in how they manage uh, economic affairs. And I mean, it's not, as Hayek said, that the planning is questioned. He said, the question is really whether successful planning works. And we've seen the, successful, the success of planning in the Soviet Union, in China, it was a complete disaster. If you went to Moscow, during the communist days, there were lines at markets and people were lining up to buy rotten apples and rotten tomatoes and there were empty shelves. That is the planning economy, it just doesn't work. Whereas the market economy takes advantage of the demand and supplies and then the shelves in markets are full. So that is the big difference and in fact, I, as a Westerner, these changes actually depress me because they were not necessary. They came about because the governments became bigger and bigger and more powerful and so forth. And we have basically very questionable democracies. And so in my depression, I decided to buy a new pool. This is my new pool in the <laughs> north of Thailand. Now you may ask, with what kind of a beer I filled it? Well, I didn't fill it with Foster or a Crown beer, and I didn't fill it with a Bud Light, which was 10 years ago still the number one brand in the world. It's now number three. Nor did I fill it with Heineken. It's the top brand among the largest 10 brands in the world for the longest period of time, about 50 years. Nor did I fill it with snow. This is now the world's largest brand. It's of course Chinese brand. But I filled it with Qingdao. You're probably familiar with Qingdao. And uh, by the way, these are the leading brands in the world nowadays. You can see that out of 10 leading brands, four are now Chinese. I'm bringing this up because Westerners frequently still think that Asians just manufacture goods and that they don't have brands. But in Asia you have some of the major brands and some of them are, as you can see, much larger than, uh, say, US brands or other brands in uh, Europe. Unfortunately, and this is a tragic event for me, my doctor told me that I can only drink one beer a day. But luckily for today, my beer arrived in the morning. So I'm well covered. But uh, to talk more seriously, you know, this shift in the balance of economic power is also evident if you look at uh, oil consumption in the world. The oil consumption in the West, okay, there is conservation, but there's always there conservation in emerging economies. In the West, it's essentially flat. And in uh, the emerging world, it uh, more than doubled in 25 years. Or you look at the industrial production. Industrial production in the developed countries is the red line, and in the emerging world, it's the blue line. You can see that the red line is trending sideward. So there's no growth in industrial production in the Western world in particular. In Japan, industrial production doesn't grow, and in the US, it grows occasionally, but for the last 12 months, industrial production is down. Whereas in emerging economies, since 2003, industrial production has doubled. So this shows you how much growth actually comes from the developing countries. Or you take trade of the developed world as a percent of global trade and you take trade of emerging economies as a percent of global trade. So in 1970, still 90% of all global trade was between the developed countries of the West and Japan, 
And uh, when there was trade between emerging economies and uh, other countries, it went usually through Europe or through the US. That was essentially the principle of colonialism and imperialism. But since the 70s, the share of the developed countries in trade has been going down, and it was 15 years ago, still slightly over 50%. But now the red line, as you can see, is slightly over 30%. And the blue line, the trade, as a percent of global trade of emerging economies, is now close to 70%. It's not that the trade of the US and Europe has gone down, but as a percent of global trade, it's gone down. So this is important to understand. Or you take commodities and please focus on the second line. This is the consumption of China as a percent of global consumption of metals. These are basically industrial commodities, copper, zinc, aluminum, and so forth and so on. So in 1970, of course, in the midst of communism, where there's no growth, it was just 2%. Then China opened up in 1978. First, the opening was very slow, and there was an experiment that was concentrated essentially in the special economic zones around Hong Kong. But because it was a success, it was then extended to the whole of China, and uh, China then uh, started to develop at an accelerating pace. So by 1990, uh, the consumption of China as a percent of global consumption was 5%. And then in year 2000, it was 12%. And now it's 47%. So in a very brief period of time, China has gone from being a non-player in the commodities markets to being essentially by far the largest player in the world. I remember in the 70s and 80s, people in Australia, they talked about iron exports to Japan, but that is now a small factor. The big thing is iron and copper exports and agricultural products to China. And so there has been a huge shift in global trade and also obviously in the power base of the world. If you have China today is the largest trading partner of 124 different countries, the US is only the largest trading partner of 74 countries. So the influence, the political influence of China on their trading partners is frequently larger than that of the US. Graphically, you can see aluminum. China consumes more aluminum than Europe, the US, and Japan combined almost twice as much. This is remarkable. Or copper, they consume more copper than Europe, the US, and Japan. And that, as I said, in a very brief period of time, that is the remarkable point, that if you look at economic history, no country has developed economically this fast. Or you take the exports of China, you see, when I came to Hong Kong in 73, and until the mid-1980s, the saying was always, if China, uh, if, sorry, if the US sneezes, Asia catches a cold. Because most of the exports from Japan, Taiwan, South Korea, Singapore, Hong Kong, they went to the US. But nowadays, that is no longer the case. If you look at this figure, the US is as in the dotted line and Europe is the blue line and the red line are Chinese exports uh, to emerging economies, to the commodity producers. Not in absolute terms, but relative to all the exports of China. So it's not that the exports to the US or Europe have been going down, but as a percent of the total exports they've been going down and their exports to emerging economies, notably the commodity producers, have been going up. And by now they're larger than the exports to either Europe or the US.
And you may ask yourself, how did it happen? Well, you see, you remember probably, or some of you may not remember, but in 1980, commodity prices peaked out. We had had this huge bull market in gold and oil in the 70s, and oil had peaked on the spot market at around $50 a barrel, and gold at $850 in 1980. Gold had been up from $35 in 1970 to $850. But after 1980, commodity prices went down, and that meant that the raw material producers of the world, including Australia, didn't do particularly well, because what they were selling, the commodities were going down in price, and what they were buying that was still going up in price, not at the same rate as in the 70s, but nevertheless it was still going up. But came uh, 1999, when really China began to grow rapidly, their demand for raw materials grew sharply because of the industrialization in China and because of high capital spending. And I may add here another point. Because of the money printing in the US, and when you print money, as Mr. Bernanke declared or emphasized, you can really drop as much money as you want into this room. But what he doesn't control is what we will do with the room. So we can buy commodities, or we can buy real estate, or equities, or we can go into wages, or consumer price inflation. Or what may happen is, if you have a global economy, and there's an absence of foreign exchange controls, and the doors are open, the money can flow out. And this is precisely what happened. The money was printed in the US, it led to consumption in the US, but it led to capital spending in China and other emerging economies, and it led to industrial production growth that I showed you before in emerging economies, and to employment gains outside the US. I mean, maybe some people think Trump is an idiot, which he probably is, but he is right in the sense that the policies in the US have actually led jobs to migrate somewhere else. Partly it was also over-regulation in the US, and partly it was when globalization occurred, the wage level obviously in China was much lower than it was in the Western world, so there was an incentive to produce in China rather than in the US. But nowadays, uh, wages are no longer that important in the manufacturing sector, and they were never very important. Much more important is regulation and uh, infrastructure. And the Chinese were able to build infrastructure at a very fast pace, and that you have to admire, because in the absence of property rights, what they could do is tell an entire village or city Please move 100 meters to the right, and you move 100 meters to the left, we're building a highway. You know, you know it's a uh, property protecting society. This is more difficult, but in China it was possible. And it was remarkable when they first built the highways in Shanghai and so forth, there were no cars. They first built the infrastructure and then the cars came. They built the bridges and the tunnels. They were empty first, but then it came. So that was really well done. And that meant that more and more investments, because of this uh, excellent infrastructure, went to China. And then, as they needed uh, for industrial production, obviously, commodities, they needed commodities to build the infrastructure. And as wage gains occurred in China, and people became more uh, affluent, they also consumed more. So that all drove the demand for commodities, and prices soared between 1999, oil price $12, the peak July 
2008, $147. And some commodities continued to rise until 2011. But afterwards, when the Chinese economy began to slow down, commodity prices eased down, and they caused this easing of commodity prices caused some economic problems, notably, say, in Brazil, or in Russia, or in the Middle East, or in Africa. So, the driver of the global economy today is not the US, it is China. Because in the US, 70% of the economy are services. Services don't need a lot of iron ore, they don't need any copper, they don't need much aluminum. But the Chinese economy still drives the demand for these raw materials. And so they are essentially the driver of the global economy. And now you think, China has 1.3 billion people, and uh, India has 1.2 billion people. We don't know exactly 1.2 or 1.1 or 1.3. But it's also a country that if they grow at 6% per annum, they will have the same influence on raw materials as China had for the last 15 years. So, you understand? A lot of changes will still occur. They may not occur, but it's likely that they will occur. And what I want to say here is really that uh, China and other emerging economies nowadays trade with each other and they bypass the Western world. It doesn't flow anymore through London or New York. They have their own trading routes and again that causes economic and geopolitical tensions. The other point I want to make is that, you see, we had a crisis in 2008. And uh, the crisis came about, and I don't want to spend too much time explaining about it, but basically there was a credit crisis because between 2000 and 2007, especially in the US, there was excessive credit growth. That was actually uh, desired and uh, produced by the US Federal Reserve. They wanted to create a housing bubble to lift economic activity. So that burst in 2007, 2008, and there was a collapse. And as a result of the collapse of the economy, demand was reduced. But because they slashed interest rates so much, capital spending continued to increase very rapidly, but not capital spending in the Western world. Where it occurred is here. Here you have essentially the uh, emerging markets capital spending, the blue line, the red line is Europe, and the dotted line here, gray, is the US, and this is down here, is Japan. So the capital spending occurred, given the zero interest rates we had in emerging economies, where emerging economies capital spending increased from 4% of global GDP to 8% of global GDP is much higher, as you can see, than in Europe or in the US. In Japan, much higher than in Japan anyway. So that meant that productivity growth in emerging economies also accelerated. And the Fed, rightly or wrongly, I think wrongly, but they fight so-called deflation. I will discuss this very briefly thereafter, but uh, if you want to fight deflation, the first thing you should do is basically see to it that the supplies don't go up. In other words, you have demand, the supplies shrink, and so prices stabilize. But their policies produce precisely this capital spending to explode. In other words, supplies of goods actually increased dramatically and put further pressure on prices. But this is remarkable, but, and also what it means is that if you look, say, here, okay, South Korea and Japan are not emerging economies, but South Korea and Taiwan and Hong Kong, Singapore, they were emerging economies, and they, they became very prosperous societies. But you can see, they employ a lot of robots. They have the highest density of robot population in the world. And I'm bringing this up because China 
has a very low concentration of robots. And as you know, some people will say, well, the Chinese economy will collapse partly because of demographics. In other words, the population will no longer grow strongly and the labor force will shrink. The Japanese population, by the way, is shrinking by something like 250,000 every year. So on 100 million, it makes quite a difference. And that's why you can do whatever you want in Japan to generate economic growth is not possible in a shrinking population. They could use a few refugees, but their system doesn't like refugees. And I think rightly so. It's a wonderful society. It's a society of perfection. Growth is not the objective. The objective is their society, and this is a marvelous society. If there is a natural disaster, go to the US. Right away you see looting. In Japan, people will help each other. That is the difference. And so what I want to say is, in China, when people say the labor force will go down, it doesn't matter. You don't need people anymore. You can have a factory 10 years ago, 20 years ago, we say a thousand people. Nowadays, you put in robots. They don't go on strike. They don't need to be, uh, drink a beer after work. And uh, the servicing is much easier. You don't need to pay additional tax on them and so forth. And there, you can have a factory that used to employ a thousand people run today with 20. So that is a huge change in the world that will also change society because uh, there will be highly skilled workers. That is not, not because the robots need to be serviced occasionally. And, uh, but uh, in general, uh, low skilled labor will almost disappear. So that is important to understand that uh, the declining labor force that will occur eventually will not have a very negative impact on per capita income in China. It may have a negative impact on essentially GDP growth, but not on a per capita impact. Now coming to the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve and I don't want to give you all the explanations because it's a bit complicated. But basically, according to a for, former Fed voting member, Greenspan, at the time, they deliberately created a Nasdaq bubble because he thought that this would be boosting economic activity and productivity growth and so forth and so on. And then after March 2000, the Nasdaq bubble broke and the market started to tumble and went down essentially Nasdaq stock 70%, the stock market close to 50%. And then the Neo Keynes and the so-called interventionists with monetary and fiscal measures, they argue we need to create a housing bubble to lift economic activity once again. So, they kept interest rates artificially low uh, between 2000 and uh, 2004. And then in 2004, they started to increase interest rates in baby steps from a 1% to 5.25% in August 2006. And then they left interest rates there. But basically, during that period of time, some economists have argued interest rates should have been much higher to contain the excessive credit growth. And the Fed was fast asleep. They always say, oh, the subprime lending crisis is well contained. It will have no impact on the economy. And Bernanke and Yellen, and by the way, I have to tell you, Yellen, she was at the time the president of the San Francisco Federal Reserve. The San Francisco Federal Reserve is responsible for the states of California, Nevada, Arizona. The ones that had the biggest housing bubbles, but she couldn't see it. And the argument by these parents recently called them clowns, I think it's an insult to the profession of clowns, which is very artistic, 
could call a central banker a clown. But uh, these, I call them academics, the professors who never worked in their lives, they never run a business, they have no personal responsibility. Anyway, they uh, argued until the crash in the housing market, property prices in the US never go down. And so they went down once, and because the system was so leveraged, many people lost their homes. Now I want to tell you a story. You see, in Hong Kong, in 1973, when I arrived, the market had just peaked out. It had peaked out at 1,700, and it was still at 1,000. And then it went down to 150, down 90% but hardly anybody went bankrupt. Why is that? Because the system was not leveraged. And then in 97, the property market in Hong Kong went down 70%. We have in Hong Kong the largest property developers in the world. None of the large property developers went bankrupt. Why? They're largely family owned and the families are conservative. They're multi-billionaires already, so they don't borrow a lot of money. They have surplus cash. Their leverage is maybe 30%, that's all. So if property prices drop 70%, it doesn't hurt them. But if home buyers in the US could buy homes with 100% mortgages, or even 120%, because there was a lot of fraud, Wells Fargo notably, the champion of fraud, but uh, that then knocked off a lot of homeowners, they were foreclosed, and these are little people, you understand, these are not the richest people, they lost their homes. I went in 2010 to Atlanta because a friend of mine had started the company buying up these uh, foreclosed homes. And I mean, it's tragic, you see these homes where families used to live with their children and suddenly they have to move out, they have to find new schools and so forth. This is a social issue. And then what happened, all these homes that were empty and had been lost by poor people, they were bought up by the hedge fund community and private equity firms out of New York. And they made a killing, because what they did is they repainted them a little bit and jacked up the rents. And that is the destructive nature of bubbles. And when the Fed and other central banks think that the creation of bubbles creates wealth, they're wrong. It's a fallacy. It's actually a travesty, because it impoverishes the majority and benefits a, major a minority. But anyway, you can see the Fed then woke up to the crisis. They slashed in December 2008 interest rates to basically zero. And the interest rates have stayed at near zero ever since. And in my view, first of all, they reacted late. Number two, they should have increased interest rates a long time ago. Because in 2010, 2011, the economy was actually relatively robust. It grew at a much faster pace than at the, at the present time. But now, last December, exactly seven years after the cuts uh, rates in 2008, they then increased the rates by a quarter of a percent. And now the discussion is, will they move up another quarter of a percent or not? My view is they will not depending also who is elected, if Trump wins the election, which is a possibility, then they will increase rates, but just to teach him who is the master, to hit him, because they hate him as much as he hates them. And uh, if Hillary is elected, probably they won't move. But anyway, even if they move a quarter percent, what is it, a half a percent or zero percent hardly makes any difference. But this zero interest rate policy, and in some countries we have negative interest rates. You know, on bonds in Japan, Switzerland, Germany, you have negative interest rates. 
has some unintended negative consequences about which I shall talk now very briefly. First of all, I explain to you that one should try to keep the government small as a percent of the economy. But zero interest rate facilitates the expansion of the government because it doesn't hurt them to borrow money. They can spend a trillion dollars in Afghanistan and a trillion dollars in Iraq and so forth. And as interest rates come down, their interest expenditures on the debt do not rise. So in the US, the US government debt was $4 trillion in 1994. And it's now close to $20 trillion, not counting the unfunded liabilities. But as you can see, the interest expense on the debt hasn't gone up. But that is precisely because interest rates here collapsed. The question is, of course, what happens if one day interest rates go up? Because then, obviously, this $250 billion in interest expenditures to pay the interest on the debt doubles very quickly, trebles. And then the deficits go up. I tell you, in my view, the central banks will keep on printing money because they're, they're in truly in good English deep shit. <laughs> yes. The other unintended consequence has been, of course, that, yeah, with zero interest rates, the debt of the government goes up. So we are now, the crisis was caused because of excessive debt in the system. And now we have even more debts. And then we have to distinguish between productive debts and unproductive debts. I will no, not go into the detail, but the most unproductive debt is the government debt. And that has exploded since 2008, as you can see. And so that, in my view, has created a problem in the future. It's not right now, because interest rates are zero. They can keep on borrowing money at zero rates. And then some academics, not clowns, academics, they essentially have written books that we have to get rid of cash because without cash the central banks will be able to implement strongly negative interest rates. Strongly negative interest rates will be they you deposit a hundred thousand dollars with a bank and after a year you get ninety five thousand back. Yes. You understand? If there is cash, people will take the cash out of the banks and put it under the mattress. Ideally not of their girlfriends, but they'll put it somewhere, safe. So, so to get rid of that ability, the central banks tell them, uh, tell the world, well, we have to get rid of cash because of cash there is criminality. Yes, I mean, you know, some small crimes happen with cash. The big thieves who are in government using they steal cash, they steal the whole bank. <laughs> so this debt of governments has been going up because of artificial low interest rates. And of course, the bigger the government becomes and the more they bail out banks and the big corporations have lobbies, you have essentially a system where the bankers and the industrialists become rich, the government becomes rich, and ordinary people are impoverished. This is the pattern of the last, essentially, 30 years. Real household income, median household income for the typical household has been going down, but the income of the super rich, the financial sector, and I'm not saying this because I'm angry, I belong to these people, unfortunately. It's a big burden in my life, but uh, I can overcome it. <laughs> but, you, but you understand, as an economist and social observer, you have to be self-critical. The financial sector has basically taken far too much out of the system and left uh, too little ordinary people. And that's why you have like these Brexit symptoms or you have Trump. He appeals to these people.
And here you can see actually that since 1970, labor compensation in GDP, you see, GDP is basically, it's difficult to measure to start with. You can fiddle around in many ways, but it's a pie of the economy, like uh, an economic pie. And that pie you can divide. So you can divide it where it goes more to labor, to ordinary people, or you can divide it where it goes more to the government and to the corporate sector. And the share of labor has been falling. And it's not just in America. I would guess that in Australia it's a similar situation. <coughs> that I mean, when I think of the 1950s, workers of America, they came to Europe they behaved like kings because the dollar was a strong currency at the time and they had relatively high wages. And nowadays they don't even, they can't afford to travel to Europe. I mentioned to you before the hardship that was imposed when the housing bubble burst and people lost their money. And I have very precise statistics. But in one hour I can't show you all the statistics. But basically, the lower income groups, they lost out as a result of the crisis. They also lost out following the Nasdaq bubble because they were leveraged. And so these people, they lost their homes and now they have to rent. But unfortunately, rents are going up strongly in the US. In some areas like San Francisco, Newport Beach, uh, Seattle, New York, Boston and so forth, you have double-digit gains in rents. By the way, you can also observe this in Australia. Young people who want an apartment in a decent location, they either pay a high rent or they can't afford to buy the apartment. So there's a change in society. And uh, in many places in the US, people will pay half their income on rents. So when people say, well, the economy is not doing well, yeah, for good reasons. How can these people who pay half their income on rents and then they pay tax still have money to spend, to invest, to save? There are lots of people who have high earnings, but at the end of the month they have zero savings. Zero. Because the rents are too high. And this is not just happening in the US, it's also happening elsewhere. And in the UK, just to show that I'm not critical just of the US, but of the system. Here you have essentially the composition of young households below 35 years, whether they rent or they own their properties. So here in 1997, still over 50% of households below 35, they owned their homes. And now it's dropped to 25% and people renting is up to 53% from 25% here. So you can see the impact of the asset inflation that the central banks have created on society. It's created a two-tier society. If you were born and your parents owned the property, and you are, were fortunate to inherit that property, that property increased dramatically in value. But if you're just working and you had nothing, <coughs> you, you will see that there is a huge increase in the wealth inequality between the household that had the assets and the households that didn't have the assets. And that creates essentially uh, slower economic growth. Incidentally, the central bank's kind of fascination or obsession with inflation and deflation is misplaced. You can see here, these are real wages in southern England, 1800 to 1900. <coughs> this is a period of deflation. In the US, there were 4 million people in 1800, 80 million in 1900, and the price level in 1900 was no higher than in 1800. And in 1870 in the US, 
and 1910 there was kind of a deflationary period. But the standards of living went up. Why? Because wages were steady and prices went down. So inflation adjusted, wages went up. And you can see here, real wages went up in England during a period of basically deflation. This is remarkable. But the central bankers will never show you this figure. Because they want inflation, because inflation will solve part of the government debt crisis. And, you know, we, you have negative interest rates, or negative interest rates in real terms. Basically, you penalize people that have savings, and you essentially reward the government that has large borrowings. I'd also like you to remind you, you know, when you look at economic statistics, you have to be very careful in the interpretation. Because let's say in this room, if I'm the government and I really want to create economic growth, I can do that by forcing you to spend. For instance, I can say, well, tonight, uh, I, the government, decree that all of you need a new vaccine. The vaccine costs $100 per person. And so then you spend that money and GDP goes up in this room. And you see here in the US, this is consumption as a percent of the economy without health care. And this is consumption as a percent of the economy with health care. In other words, most of the increment in consumption was driven by higher health care expenditures. And maybe you read that now in most states in the US, Obamacare means that uh, uh, the premiums of uh, insurances will go up. They've already gone up something like 40-50% in the last two years. But they'll go up another 25 to 40% next year. There was a comedian already 30 years ago who said, used to say, uh, health care is very expensive but wait until it's free of charge, it will be much more expensive. And that is precisely what Obamacare has done. It's increased the cost of health care. And don't tell me that health care in the US is far superior to health care in Australia or in Europe. We spend roughly 10% of GDP on health care in Europe, in some countries even less. And in the US they spend something like 21%. The, the system is completely dysfunctional. But with that, you can then show GDP grows. But in reality, there is no growth. It's uh, just an expenditure that people actually dislike uh, meeting. Finally, we have negative interest rates in many countries, zero interest rates. I'd like to remind you that this is really an experiment by some mad professors. Never in the history of mankind have interest rates been this low. Never. You can see these are interest rates over the last, what is it, 5,000 years or whatever. And, and now we are at zero. I mean, this is remarkable. And it will end badly, for sure. We just don't know how badly it will end and what the progression is until the system breaks but it will eventually break. The central bankers, by having zero interest rates, they want you to spend more. But say, in this room, we all get 6% interest on our savings, and then over the two-year period, we only get 0% interest and eventually negative interest rate. What do you think we do? We spend more or we spend less? If we are retirees, we'll say, well, we don't get the 6%, we have to save more. And so the zero interest rates have rather the impact, as in Sweden, Denmark, Finland, Switzerland, to increase the savings rate. Here is the deposit rate coming down and the savings rate going up. Same for Japan. 
You want to spend a rising spending, you better increase interest rate. If you have zero interest rates, it makes uh, people very insecure. Now the US, as you know, has the talent not to in only to intervene in economic matters, but obviously also in political issues. And one of them really backfired very badly. Uh, basically, already a hundred years ago, there was a British uh, economist and historian who wrote about the land power, the hinterland, and he wrote about sea powers and so forth, and is essentially known to be the first geopolitician uh, in the world. He wrote several books. And uh, the idea was <laughs> you have to prevent the hinterland, which essentially stretches from Eastern Europe to China, Far East Russia, from becoming an empire, from becoming an important power. And uh, that, uh, therefore, you had to essentially split these countries. <coughs> now, the thing is, that has so far been the case. Russia and China have never been great friends, but now they are. And why are they? Because the US badly miscalculated in one instance. They thought they can just push forward here into eastern Ukraine and build and essentially include Ukraine into NATO and build missile bases there in order to essentially contain Russia. Then Russia obviously felt uh, an aggression because you have to see this Ukraine, uh, this uh, island here, Crimea, was always in Ru Russian possession. It was given away for a while to Ukraine under, I think, Khrushchev or Brezhnev. But this is everything east of the Dnieper is Russian territory, it's not Ukraine. And historically, you can see that the border with Russia was Germany, the Austria-Hungarian Empire, and Romania. There was no Ukraine and there was no Poland. In fact, Bismarck, he famously said, the Poland, one should all wipe them out. It's not my view, I'm just saying what they, their view was at the time. In any event, the Russian view of the world is a different perspective than the neocons in the US. And for Russia, the Crimea is of course very important because from the Crimea they have access to the Black Sea and to the Mediterranean. That they will never give up. The Crimea has no strategic value to the US and no strategic value to anyone except to Russia. The same South China Sea has a strategic value to China. They're not going to give it up. <coughs> and so that has created tensions and it's driven essentially Putin towards China. And so now you have these two powers that are on friendly terms. It's not a relationship of love, but of practicality. And similarly, the US has begun or began to intervene in the Middle East and under Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, I tell you, if she is elected, the likelihood of war increases significantly. But she had this brilliant idea about nation building. Now, can you imagine Americans building nations? <laughs> it's just an idea. Everything they touched, they messed up. They touched Afghanistan, it's worse today than it was at the time. They touched uh, Iraq, it's a disaster as well. They touched Syria, it's a disaster. And they touched Libya, it's a disaster. Everything. I mean, this is just in the Middle East. You go to Latin America, the country that has received the most attention in the Caribbean from America is Haiti, including the Clinton Foundation. It's a living disaster, Haiti, in every respect. And so, about the last people I would use to essentially 
the look after world order or the US. But this is precisely what they've done, and I'm bringing this up because for the US nowadays, the Middle East has no essentially economic meaning any longer because they have oil themselves. They can source oil out of Canada and Mexico and Venezuela and Ecuador and the west coast of Africa. But China and Japan and Asia in general sources most of its oil from the Middle East. And that uh, will obviously eventually lead to tensions. Also, the improved relationship with Iran. The Iran is a large country, much larger than Saudi Arabia in terms of population. And they are Shias, whereas here you have the Sunni. And so I think that uh, problems in the Middle East, or if not war, is quite likely, particularly under a Hillary Clinton regime, who is backed by the neocons. Trump has no love for neocons, and also he realizes that America can't be the policeman of the whole world. I'm bringing this up because it also has something to do with Asia. As you know, a few years ago, uh, Hillary Clinton openly declared a pivot to Asia. Now you have to see this very clearly. The US has its perspective of how the world should be structured. But the perspective in the Kremlin, in Russia, is of course a different perspective as it is in Beijing. If you're sitting in Beijing and someone tells you, like the US, there's a pivot to Asia, it can only be interpreted as an aggression. The Chinese reacted. But say, assuming people keep their reason. You see, the issue is really, these are the American bases in, the, in Southeast Asia. They have military bases everywhere. How many military bases do the Chinese have in Canada and in Mexico, in the Caribbean? None. You think the US would love to have Chinese bases just north of their border and in uh, Mexico and in the Caribbean? They wouldn't like it either. So the Chinese, they are rational. They look at the Asia the way they look at. Most Asian countries essentially are China-centric in terms of trade and in terms of investments and in terms of tourism, as you probably noticed. So the point is, if we have peace, this region will grow very rapidly. By this region, I mean essentially Southeast Asia and, in, and specifically Indochina. Indochina being Vietnam in the east, this snake here, and uh, northwest Laos, southwest Cambodia, and then Thailand, and then Myanmar, India, Bangladesh, and here Yunnan province of China, and here in the south, Malaysia, Singapore. So that region has tremendous growth potential. Altogether, essentially, if I include parts of India, it would be five, six hundred million people. They start from a very low level. And one of the reasons to be optimistic about the region, provided there is peace, is the following. The level of cost in China has gone up dramatically, and nowadays, the major investors in Asia are no longer the Western countries or the US, they're Asian countries themselves. Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, Hong Kong, and they don't want to have all their investments concentrated in China. So they increasingly invest also for geopolitical reasons here in Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, Thailand and Myanmar, especially Myanmar now. These are boom towns at the present time and they are growing very rapidly. If you look at, say, Indochina, you see, the difference between China and the U.S. is this. If the U.S. says we're going to build a bridge, they get the World Bank to make a study about it. So all these, not clowns, also academics that are at the World Bank, they have to travel. They have to make an analysis of the bridge 
And that will take at least five years because everybody likes to stay in luxury hotels on taxpayers' money. A uh, study is uh, finished and completed, and then the supervisors, uh, the bosses of the World Bank, also have to go there and take a nice long holiday. And so finally, the project is maybe approved after 10 years when the bridge is actually no longer needed. The Chinese, they go and they say, okay, we're going to build a road and the bridge and a tunnel, and they do it. I've seen that in Cambodia. One looks like a very good friend in Cambodia, an influential family. And I went there and the traffic was horrendous and the next time, six months later, there was an overpass. So I asked my friend, well, who built this overpass? He said, the Chinese came and just built it in six months. <clears throat> and that's the difference. They're going to build rails and road links throughout Indochina. And they do it. They don't need to get an approval from some useless bureaucrat. They just send the company and do it. Never mind the bridge breaks down after six months. <laughs> then they rebuild it. <laughs> but at least they do something, you understand? So they have more economic weight. And then the other companies also come in and put money in. And so you have these boom towns at the present time. This is the GDP per capita of uh, Myanmar, Laos, Cambodia, and so forth, Vietnam. It's very low compared to the GDP per capita of Thailand. So as they open up, say, Vietnam, since uh, 2007, Vietnam has by far the best export performance of any country in the world. This is a country that will eventually have a much larger higher GDP per capita than Thailand. It's a very hard working country, but you need peace. We have investments on the coast near Da Nang in Vietnam, I can tell you. It's like Melbourne 20 years ago, and suddenly there is a, a boom taking place. Tourism, you see the Chinese, until the mid-80s, they could hardly travel outside the country. There were maybe maximum, but really maximum, a million Chinese that would go outside the country until 85. And by year 2000, it was 10 million. And now it is uh, 120 million. 120 million tra Chinese travelers outside the country. And as you can see here, this year it will be 130 million. The projections are that it will go up to 235 million. But I want you to visualize the size. 235 million people who will climb Ayers Rock. I don't know how the Ayers Rock will look like. You understand? We're not talking about a country. We're talking about China as an empire. There are many provinces that are as large as Italy or France and so forth, many. So it's like the US, one part of China can grow and another contract. Uh, like in the US, when the oil crisis hit in 1985, all the Texas banks went bankrupt and the Texas real estate market collapsed and it was a disaster, so Texas went into recession. Oklahoma went into recession. Colorado went into recession, but uh, the New England boomed in the early 90s. California was in a recession. There was a property market crash and the crisis, but the rest of the country did okay. So when people talk about a crisis in China, yeah, it can now occur, but maybe not everywhere. Maybe everywhere. Who knows? The U.S. 1800 to today, they already had in the 19th century. 19 different financial crises and recessions, and the Civil War. Then they had World War I. Then they had, uh, essentially, they survived the hyperinflation period in Germany. World War II, before that, the Depression, and then, then and the country still grew. So China can have many recessions. They will come out and eventually grow again. Like Australia, you had many crises in Australia. There's a book, The Boomers. It's about uh, essentially land booms in Australia. One of the problems in China is obviously the excessive credit growth. You can see we have now very high 
debt as a percent of the economy, in uh, the shadow banking system as a percent of the economy, the loans have gone up from 5% of GDP to over 20% of GDP. There's a lot of fraud and so forth. And yes, there will be a slowdown, regardless. Will there be a serious recession? Likely, but not certainly. So how do we invest in this environment of uh, essentially uh, financial repression by central banks that have created uh, inflated asset markets and created bubbles here and there and every bubble eventually deflates as you know in Australia and also we can uh, we have to uh, discuss whether some people say there is a currency war between different countries that countries want to devalue their currencies in order to be competitive I don't think there is a currency war among the major central banks. They talk to each other every day. Yellen, Federal Reserve, Carney, Bank of England, Draghi, ECB, Kuroda, Bank of Japan, they coordinate their monetary policies. And one year this central bank expands its balance sheet, you know, they monetize, they print money in good English, another year the other one does it. And so the currency is moved, but it's always controlled by the central banks, and I have some reservations where actually the central banks themselves uh, control this, or whether some people in the background control central banks. So anyway, uh, in this environment, you are all traders, okay? As you know, it's not easy to predict the market, but it's impossible to predict anything if the market is manipulated by essentially, as it is now, by central bankers. Some people call it uh, they fix interest rates, but look, if I were a trader at the bank and I would manipulate interest rates the way central banks do it, I'd be in jail. For sure, not my boss, but I. And so we have this system today where government agencies like central banks, they can do things the private sector cannot do. And these are very difficult markets to trade. But uh, you can essentially anticipate what they will do. In my view, as I said, I think they will continue to print money. You can see here, in the last, uh, uh, between 98 and today, they've increased their balance sheet 16 times. You know, so that is the money they created over the period of time. Now, some people say the central banks are out of bullet. Well, my view is you haven't seen anything yet. They can increase their balance sheet another 100 times. Yes, they can go all the way. It's not what I recommend, you understand? But knowing their thinking of these mad professors, they will go all the way. And so that is a very difficult environment for investors, but keep in mind, they can do it, and they have the academics on their side because they pay the academics, they pay the professors at universities consulting fees. So because of these consulting fees, the academics at Yale and Harvard, Princeton, will never write anything against central bankers. <coughs> they will write in their favor. Well, myself, what I've done is I just uh, take red wine, I get 13% uh, for sure. Whereas investors, they get negative interest rates or zero interest rate. And the other thing about the central banks and that they have written about, they have written about that because in Europe, the ECB is running out of bonds they can buy because they are, have some rules that they can only buy a certain amount, a certain quality. So not they, can, they have to buy other stuff eventually. The proposal is, they've done it in Switzerland, they've done it in Japan, they bought stocks. So if they bought, buy shares, eventually they could own their entire share market. You understand? 
They, they, get, they can do it. Then you have socialism realized by the back door. And here you have the Fed. Hello, young man, I'm with the Federal Reserve. Today we're buying baseball cards. You know, they can go then and buy homes, or they can buy baseball cards, or they can buy a Ferrari, 38 million, this one. So they can do all kinds of things. I mean, you have to wonder, why do they have this power? Well, they have this power because the governments depend on them buying the bonds and financing governments. But it's not the right solution. Global liquidity has been tightening. As you can see, this is global liquidity. I don't want to explain precisely what it is, but it has decelerated here after 2011, coincides with the weakness in commodity prices and the weakness in emerging economies, it's turned down, it may start to turn up, which would be net, when liquidity tightens, it coincides with a period of dollar strength. When global liquidity expands, usually the dollar goes weaker, and it's favorable for, expanding liquidity is favorable for emerging economies, and favorable for commodity prices. So if you assume that global liquidity will turn up, and I think it will, because I believe that even if the Fed increases the Fed fund rate in December by a quarter of a percent, which I don't think they will, but if they did, they will cut rates again next year and launch QE4. We had QE1, we had QE2, we have Operation Twist, followed by QE3, and I think we will go to QE99 in the US. <laughs> yes, once a government program is in place, it usually is not abandoned. It goes on, it's a perpetuum mobile. The monetary policies have created inflated asset markets, you can see it here in uh, Melbourne. The net worth of households as a percent of income is at the highest level. You see, this is where I started to work. At that time, your salary was high in comparison to assets. So you could buy assets at low prices. Now you pay very high prices for assets. This is how many hours it takes to buy one S&P future, uh, one S&P index. When I started to work here, in the 80s, it took essentially 25 hours, and now it takes 90 hours. So, once again, it was inexpensive to buy assets uh, in the 70s, 80s, and now it's very expensive to buy assets. This is the market cap as a percent of the economy in the US. Essentially, the value of the stock market as a percent of the economy. It was low here in the 70s and 80s, 25%, now it's close to 150%. So you're paying high price, and this is not only in the US, globally the same. We have a very high uh, market cap to economy ratio. It means the, the entire financial system, if you take the global economy as this table here, then what we have is a financial system that is much larger than the table. Stock market capitalization, bond market capitalization, and banking system. And that creates, and this is the good part, the good news for you, it creates a lot of volatility. Central banks basically should look to it to have financial stability, but they have created instability. So for the trader it offer, offers opportunity but obviously only for the trader who is on the right side. That is the problem. But uh, I just want to say, I mean, aside from the volatility, what is very important is that you have your money with a safe place. You understand? If you have your money on deposit with Deutsche Bank or Credit Suisse in Switzerland and so forth, uh, it's like in Cyprus, the large depositors, they can get their money back. Only small depositors, less than 100,000, got all their money. The larger ones, there was a bail-in. So in other words, they took, say, 50% of your money 
to bail out the bank. So I recommend, say, and I'm not paid to say that, but I think CNC has a platform that is relatively or very stable. They don't take their own positions, unlike, say, Goldman Sachs. You deal with Goldman Sachs, they take own positions against the clients and so forth. So that is a consideration to also think about when you make investments, the solidity of the financial institution you want to have your money with or your securities with. I just want to show you what happens when they really go out and print money. You see, I also believe that one day the big trade will be to short either the dollar or to short the stock market in the US. But you have to be mindful when shorting stocks that if you print money, they'll go up. They may not go up inflation adjusted and they may not go up against, say, a stable currency. But as I pointed out, nowadays, please give me a stable currency. They're basically all printing money. So what, what happens when one country prints money here and other countries don't print money? In the country where they print money, there'll be inflation one way or the other. The price level then becomes high compared to other countries. And then the currency goes down against the countries that don't print money. But in our case, they print everywhere. So the currency is basically, yes, there is fluctuation between currencies. But over a long period of time, not that much, because they will print. But what can happen is that the value of, say, currencies, the purchasing power goes down, say, against something stable like precious metals. That is likely to happen, that uh, obviously precious metals move up. But nevertheless, I want to show you what happened in Latin America, because in Latin America in the 80s, <coughs> all the countries printed money. And so their stock markets in local currencies went up, but the currency went down. So you had a situation where stocks go up, and the currency goes down like this. So here is the example of Mexican stocks, and you can focus here on the essentially first line between 1978 and 1988. This is in local currency, okay? So we start in 78, the index between 1,000 and 1,700, so let's say 1,000, and then we went to a peak here in uh, 2000, uh, in 1987, of 343,000. So we're up 300 times in local currency. But as I said, the currency went down. So if I adjust the currency decline, the stock market increase for the currency decline, I can measure the index every year in dollar terms. So the local currency, uh, the local stock market goes up and the currency goes down. And then we get here a start in dollar terms around 48 to 70 in 1979. And then we dropped to five in dollar terms. This is the hyperinflation economy. It creates at one stage tremendous undervaluation because the currency goes down like a stone and stocks don't immediately adjust on the upside. So properties and stocks become very cheap. But afterwards they catch up because people, the rich people, they notice that stocks and properties are very cheap so they buy them and then the share market goes up more than the depreciation of the currency. So in dollar terms we went from five to actually 220. So you can you have to realize this volatility is created essentially by excessive money. And I think it will happen that in the next few years you have these kind of opportunities in markets like 
property market in the US was very, very depressed in 2009-2010. There was an opportunity to buy properties at very low prices. By the way, here in Melbourne, in the mid-1990s, I know even some of the largest solid property owners that were in chocolate. They didn't have to sell, but the property market had looked disastrous. And the leverage players were out of business and they had to sell assets and so forth. So you have these fluctuations, and I think as a trader, uh, you can take advantage of some of these opportunities. But you have to obviously be careful, and it's easier to take advantage of these opportunities if you have a cash flow. So if I were a trader, I would say, I'm not going to trade with all my money, but only with part of my money and keep some reserves, because great opportunities don't come along every five minutes. You understand? A great opportunity maybe only knocks on your door every 10 years. Maybe there is a great opportunity every year, but you may not see it. So this is an important point. You have to kind of, when you trade, trade with discipline. And you have to know yourself. I'm trading because I'm a gambler, so I rather trade something then go to the office or trade something rather than to go to a casino? Or do I sincerely want to make money? If you sincerely want to make money, you have to do it with discipline and with patience. I believe that uh, in this current uh, situation, you should own some precious metals, gold, silver, platinum. This year, as you know, gold shares are up in some cases more than 100%, sometimes 200%. Albeit from a very, very low level, they have dropped 90, 95% from the peak in 2010, 2011, and became incredibly depressed last November, and then they started to move up. Then there is a correction at the present time, but I still think you have to own physical gold, silver, and platinum, and don't store it in the US. <laughs> You'd be mad, because they took it already once away in the US, and they are likely to move again. If they take cash away, then people will own physical assets like gold, silver, platinum. The central banks will say, well, let's make it illegal to own these uh, precious metals. But basically, I think we have had a bull market in gold since 1999, $255. We went to $1,921. Then we went down to around $1,000. And now we are, in my view, again in a bull market. But we are right now probably in an intermediate correction. That will probably end once the dollar weakens. Now everybody's bullish about the dollar, and maybe the dollar will overshoot. But as I said, if you think about QE4 sometimes next year, then obviously the dollar will weaken one day again. Platinum is probably the cheapest uh, precious metals. Also silver is probably cheaper than gold. But I prefer gold to these. Uh, I also own some platinum, not much silver. And uh, the shares are, of course, more interesting in terms of capital gains. They'll go up more. If, say, gold goes up 10%, the shares will rally, say, 30%. Uh, the problem of the system today, it's not about uh, too big to fail. It's about too big to jail. You know, when you think of it. Wells Fargo opens close to 3 million fake accounts. Well, in my book, this is a fraud. This is fraud. If I'm a small company, I have fake accounts. The SEC in Hong Kong is called SFC, a useless organization, but nevertheless, they will close me down, for sure. This is fraudulent. Do you think any of these bosses go to jail? No, they get medals. And if they go to jail, they go to a country club. They don't go to Sing Sing or Alcatraz. So this is the situation. And in this situation, I think you should own, again, commodities. In particular, you live in Australia. 
I can tell you the difference between gold, silver and platinum and say agricultural commodities is that gold, silver, platinum is not perishable. So all the gold that was ever mined still exists. And not all the wheat that was ever harvested still exists. You understand? So it has to be produced every year. And in my view, the agricultural commodities, wheat, corn, soybeans, are very low at the present time, historically seen. And so that's an, uh, an area I would invest. And in general, if you compare commodity prices to stock prices, occasionally commodity prices are high, 1980, and stocks are low. And occasionally stocks are very high, like in the year 2000, and commodities are low. I think we're now again in a situation where stocks, by the way, in, around the world, and bonds anyway, are high and commodities are relatively low. So I would make essentially investments in, co in commodities at the present time. Anyway, I thank you very much for your attention. You've been a very nice and patient audience. And if you have any questions, please ask me. Thank you. So what is the question? Thank you. Uh, Very quickly, uh, can you share a little bit of light about the fact that velocity has dropped so precipitously and therefore we don't see the inflation, financial inflation that you talked about? Thank you. Well, I mean, uh, the academics talk about the savings clock. My view is that they is excessive printing of money and that this money then uh, doesn't find a home in uh, essentially the main economy or what you would call main street in the traditional economy where this money then flows into it is into financial engineering and I had a figure there it, part of the reason for US stocks to go up is actually not uh, that corporate profits are rising at the present time, they're actually going down. And it's not uh, because of uh, retail buying. The retailers, they have no money left. They lost their first their money in the crisis of 2000, when the Nasdaq collapsed. Then they lost their money in the housing bubble, and then they lost money in, because they own financial stocks and financial stocks after 2007 collapsed. So they have no money left. So retail participation is very low and you have mutual fund outflows in not only the US and Europe. But you have a huge cash build up among the corporate sector and the corporations. And that I don't know precisely say if I'm a corporation and you have zero interest rates you would make the argument as an economist that you would go and build a factory with that in other words the capital spending would be strong but w with the exception of emerging economies it's been weak very weak in the US and in Europe nobody builds a factory probably because at zero interest rates corporations they can uh, essentially borrow at money at very low rates and they have cash. So for them, it essentially is easier and more profitable to buy a competitor. What they can then do, and this has also contributed to the sluggish economy, say, if I'm Pfizer and I buy Bristol Myers, or if I'm BHP and I buy Rio Tinto, say, for Australia's purpose, then I can fire essentially half the management because I don't need the same number of people as the two companies have. And so I can reduce the workforce very significantly and I can rationalize, I can get rid of to head offices, I could just have one, and and end. And so, because of that, I think that velocity is down. Number two, and this is another reason why 
I mean, I'm also bearish about the world and so forth, and I think a recession is coming because we have a seven years expansion and essentially a credit-driven boom. But, uh, you know, we also have to recognize, uh, this is not my figure, Bloomberg says there's $50 trillion in cash. $50 trillion. It's a lot of money in cash. And my private banker friends say, mostly in Singapore and in Switzerland, they all say, there are lots of people, they sit on cash. But I want to warn you that on, in a traditional economy where the system functions, uh, cash, that is what you're told at school, cash is the safest. Government bonds are a little bit less safe because they have a maturity, but you have a slightly higher yield on government bonds than on cash. And then stocks are more risky and very risky are commodities because they don't have a dividend yield and uh, they don't uh, have earnings. So that is essentially the pattern that cash is the safest. But in today's environment, where you have zero interest rates and in some countries negative interest rates, cash is not safe. If you give cash to a bank, the bank goes bust. Is it safe? Then you have to choose the bank. I happen to think, for instance, that an Australian bank is probably safer than a US bank or a, or a German bank. Or I would think that a Thai bank, because the Thai banks, they never understood what derivatives are, so they don't use them. They don't have them. So they are relatively safe. They just take money deposit, either they lend it to some people, to buy a house or build a company or whatnot. So they are relatively safe, whereas the complicated nature of finance today in the Western world is such that the management doesn't even understand it. They don't even know about it. The traders, they, you know, if you have a trader is very profitable, you say to yourself, well, let him do. Then suddenly he loses a ton of money. But I think that is the reason why velocity is down. But I'm not 100% sure, and you know, different economies, they have different interpretations. Uh, I think you wanted to ask a question, or? Yes, please, go ahead. Purely as a um, technical analyst, my Interest has been piqued by the fact that oil, sewer, and gold has gone up for the peak. Personally, I think they're going to be slammed. So what is the question? The question is, why, what has happened to copper? Why has that not done anything except proceeded straight down? Well, basically, there are reasons that oil went down much more than copper from the peak. So you had a decline of, uh, the peak was $147 and you went down to $30 and then it became very oversold. Copper is down, but not the same percentage. And uh, oil is, of course, a commodity that is slightly different than copper in the sense that it also depends on geopolitical events. You understand? The copper supply is there. But uh, oil depends on a lot of developments, especially A, political developments in the US, you know, about uh, who is president and who is in favor of the oil industry and further exploration and the pipeline and so forth and so on. And number two, in particular, about the situation in the Middle East and in Russia. So I think there are reasons why copper isn't gone, hasn't gone down so much and why it didn't rebound as much as oil. But in general, I would say that uh, if I had to take a contrarian bet, I would essentially consider copper and also other uh, industrial commodities to be relatively low and that they could move up in 2017, 2018 at latest. 
Any other questions? We have today ladies' night. <laughs> it is ladies' night. Well, I'm a financial planner, so I'm a little bit different to the mainstream audience here. Um, our focus at the moment is on asset allocation, and hopefully we can take opportunities, obviously, obviously, as you said, in terms of volatility. But my question to you, Mark, is if, say, Clinton does win the election, and there are further geopolitical issues, especially in Iran and Russia, what asset class would you be investing in? Well, if she wins the election, she truly hates uh, Putin and her surroundings like uh, Victoria Nuland, uh, she also hates Putin, they don't even talk to each other. Kerry and Putin get along reasonably well. But if Hillary is elected, I think uh, the likelihood that they will kind of do something to humiliate Putin is very high. And in that situation, I would think that uh, particularly oil would be reasonably attractive. And, uh, but I would also think that if uh, Trump is elected, it would be very, very favorable for Russian assets. Real estate and stocks and Russian bonds. That would be very favorable. And so the difference is really quite crucial. Also, if Hillary is elected, I think the tone towards China will be much harsher than if Trump is elected. He says, oh, we're going to cut off e exports from China and so forth. But he will realize very quickly that if they don't import from China, they, they have to import necessities. Because in America, a lot of electronics are no longer produced. If they don't import from China, they don't import iPhones and so forth and so on. So it's not a question of we're going to cut imports from China. It's that uh, we have to import from China because in the US, there are lots of goods they don't produce anymore. And by the way, all these embargoes and so forth, they are completely useless. Look, no. the embargo against Russia. Russia is surrounded by countries that have been smuggling goods for the last 500 years. Do you think they don't know how to smuggle goods into Russia? Or Russia can buy anything in China, they can buy a Mercedes in China and ship it to Russia. And so these embargoes are kind of more rhetoric than reality. And actually, you know, there is more and more talk about this uh, disconnect between the people and the government. If you ask Europeans, I would say that 90% of Germans, they will say, we don't understand why we have an embargo against Russia. Russia and Germany have, with the exception of World War II, essentially been friends. Culturally, they're very close. They've been trading with each other. The German industry benefits from investments in Russia and from exports to Russia. So ordinary people in Europe, they have a very different view. They don't look at the world and say America is good and Putin is evil. You know, Putin is smarter. Yes, he's smarter than these politicians in the US, certainly the current one. But uh, uh, the issue is also here in Asia. You have, say, in Thailand, the military government was, of course, right away criticized by the US. And they didn't invite the Prayut, the general, to the July 4th celebration. Probably he was happy not to have to go. But it's the wrong approach of America. Asians have different systems. You can't go to China and say you have to have democracy. Because they have a democracy, but they have the Greek democracy model of uh, BC, where only few people could vote. Only few people in Greece could vote. And I wrote my doctoral thesis about the financial reform of Robert Peel. <laughs> 
So I'm familiar with that. In the 19th century, only very few people in Britain could vote. They had a democracy, but you had to have a certain income and a certain status, otherwise you couldn't vote. This is an experiment that everyone can vote. And as you well know, until the 1930s in most countries, they didn't have uh, female voting, you know, those women couldn't vote in Switzerland until the mid-1990s. And since then the country has gone down. <laughs> this, is, this is true. It's been downhill ever since. So I have to go to my pool now. We do. Well, ladies and gentlemen, back here is our media commitment. So we'll have to go.